muted. Good morning. My name is Eric Yen, Director of Marketing for Shield Health Healthcare. Welcome to our webinar titled Home Tube Feeding, How to Troubleshoot and Manage Common Complications. Your presenter today is Amy Long Carrera. Amy Long Carrera is our corporate registered dietitian. She is a certified nutrition support clinician with more than 10 years of clinical nutrition experience. Today she's going to share her expertise in working with people at home on tube feeding. Listeners will be in a listen-only mode. This webinar is being recorded, so if you missed any portion of this web, you can catch it on our community page, shieldhealthcare.com slash community. At this time, I'd like to pass the presentation over to Amy. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. This presentation is geared toward both clinicians and the home tube feeding community. Here's a quick overview of what we'll cover during the webinar. First, we'll go over some basics, such as feeding roots, tubes, and methods. Then we'll get into some of the most common complications that people experience on tube feeding at home. And for each complication, I'll discuss some potential causes and solutions. And I'll save about 15 minutes at the end for any questions that you might have. So let's get started. There are a few different routes that formula can take to get to where it needs to in the body. Nasal tubes are inserted through the nasal passage and passed down either into the stomach, as in an NG tube, or all the way to the small intestine, such as an NJ tube. No artificial hole or opening is created. With a gastrostomy tube, a stoma, or an opening, is created through the skin and into the stomach. Gastrostomy tubes, or G tubes, feed into your stomach. Your stomach is able to hold nutrients until the intestine is ready to receive them. An opening can also be created that goes into the small intestine, usually into the jejunum. In this case, you have a J-tube. This root is used when the stomach isn't working properly. Feeding needs to happen more slowly because the small intestine isn't able to store nutrients like the stomach can. An NG tube is usually used short term, like for a few weeks. Some people start out with this kind of tube and then move on to a more permanent tube eventually. More permanent tubes, such as G tubes and J tubes, can be what I will refer to as regular or low profile. A regular G tube or J tube has a longer tubing at the end that kind of hangs out of the stomach. You can either have an inflatable balloon to hold it in place or an internal bumper which would also hold it in place. On the other hand, a low-profile G-tube or J-tube sits at skin level, so it's less noticeable than a regular tube. When you're not using it, it snaps shut. Because it doesn't have its own tubing, like a regular G-tube, you do need to have extension tubing when you want to use it. Low-profile G-tubes can also have a non-balloon internal bumper or a balloon that's inflated with water to keep it in place. If they do have a balloon, usually they can be replaced at home. If they don't have a balloon, typically they would be replaced by a medical professional. So bolus or syringe feeding uses a syringe to deliver formula through the tube. Most people take a meal of formula about every three hours or so. It might take between five to 20 minutes. Gravity feeding requires a feeding bag with a roller clamp to control the rate and an IV pole to hang the bag. This method delivers formula more slowly, usually over 30 to 60 minutes. Pump feeding is potentially the slowest feeding method and gives you the most control because the pump controls the speed of the formula flows. Complications are more likely to happen if formula flows too fast with any of these methods. So these are some of the common complications that people experience when they're on tube feeding at home. We'll talk about nausea and vomiting, diarrhea and constipation, some issues that can happen with the skin around the tube, and then we'll get into clogs or blocked feeding tubes and how you can prevent or solve those. So why do we care about preventing complications? Well, one study showed that almost a quarter of patients who were discharged home 
went back into the hospital within the first six months because of problems related to their tube feeding. So reducing complications may help to prevent hospital readmissions. When your patient doesn't get enough nutrition because of problems related to the tube feeding, the risk of malnutrition increases. Malnutrition makes your patients more prone to infection, delayed wound healing, and other issues that could land them back in the hospital. Preventing complications can also improve their quality of life. In one study, over 60% of people on tube feeding at home had problems like nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, or constipation. If your patient experiences nausea on tube feeding, one of the first things to think about is how fast the formula is moving. Nausea can obviously happen if you feed too quickly, so slowing down the rate may help. If you're bolus feeding, this may mean only giving a quarter or a half a can at a time with a minute or two in between. You can also try lowering the syringe closer to the stomach to slow it down. Remember, the higher the syringe is in relation to the stomach, the faster the formula will flow down by gravity. If you're feeding with a gravity bag, you can slow down the rate by closing down the roller clamp onto the tubing so that the formula slows down. With a feeding pump, you can control the rate by adjusting the numbers on the screen. Try lowering the rate by half and see how your patient feels. As they start to feel better, slowly increase the rate to a point where you can feed without nausea. If your patient is vomiting, you should stop the feeding and try starting it at a lower rate when they start to feel a little bit better. If the vomiting doesn't improve, you may need to call the doctor. Always let the doctor know or the dietitian know if the patient can't tolerate the formula at the recommended rate. If they're not able to get in all their nutrition in the time that you're giving it to them, we may need to change the regimen so they can get it all in. The next thing that you might think about if your patient is experiencing nausea and vomiting is the tube itself. If the tip of the tube has moved out of place inside the stomach, it may cause irritation and nausea. In a few minutes, we'll go over how to check the position of the tube by looking at the markings on the outside or by checking the water in the balloon. Another thing to think about is when your patient's last bowel movement was. Constipation may be suspected if there was a bowel movement less than three times per week, or if your patient has pain or difficulty passing hard, dry stools. Obviously, everyone's different, so any change in their usual bowel habits could also indicate constipation. And this could definitely contribute to nausea and an inability to tolerate their formula. So in a few slides, we'll look at how to deal with constipation. Here's a few more tips for preventing nausea and vomiting. First, you want to make sure your patient is sitting up, like this little girl is doing with her bowl is feeding, or that the head of the bed is elevated at least 30 degrees during the feeding and for at least 30 to 60 minutes afterward. You also want to avoid using some formula that's right out of the fridge. Cold formula could cause stomach upset. So you might want to leave it out for a few minutes before using it. If your patient feels they're taking too much formula and water at one time, you may want to separate the water flush to a later time. Finally, of course, you want to make sure that you are priming the patient's feeding set and the extension set, if they have one, to prevent pushing air into the stomach. Let's move on to diarrhea. Sometimes it's the tube feeding, sometimes it's something else. Let's start with the tube feeding. If tube feeding is your patient's sole source of nutrition, remember that bowel movements may not be the same as they would be if they were eating solid foods, but they shouldn't be watery. Loose stools may be the result of too much formula too fast. The solution may be to slow it down using some of the methods that we talked about earlier on slide nine. Remember, if you slow down the feeding, you may need to feed for a longer period of time to get in all of their nutrition. This may require a new feeding regimen. If you try slowing down feeding and that doesn't help, it may be something else doctor or the dietitian may try a less concentrated formula or one that has nutrients that are already broken down or pre-digested and more easily absorbed. And that's if malabsorption is suspected. 
Diarrhea may also be the result of infection. So consider a stool culture if your patient has a history of C. diff or if they've been on antibiotics in the past few months. And as we all know, some medications can contribute to stools. So you may want to review the meds with the doctor or pharmacist. Um, you want to determine if any of them are contributing to the problem. Here's a few that we all are probably aware of, antibiotics, laxatives, promotility agents like Reglan, and then there are liquid medications um, that contain sorbitol. Those can cause loose stools. We don't always think about those. So it's important to dilute liquid meds with water before administering them to help prevent the risk of loose stools. If your patient's having diarrhea, you want to minimize the risk of dehydration. So we want to feed through the diarrhea if we can. Continue feeding at the rate that they can tolerate um, without increasing the loose stools and continue to give water through the tube. If your patient is unable to tolerate formula and water, you should consider a physician consult, maybe using um, an electrolyte replacement. You might also talk to the doctor about taking a probiotic supplement to help manage diarrhea. Probiotics are live bacteria that provide health benefits to the host, and certain strains have been shown to be effective in preventing antibiotic-associated diarrhea, and I've shown um, a couple of those here. It may also be helpful to try a formula that contains fiber. Certain types of fiber, particularly insoluble fiber, help add bulk to stools and help to support the good bacteria in your colon. Certain types of fiber called prebiotics are food for the good bacteria in your colon. When they process the prebiotics, they help to inhibit disease-causing bacteria. They also help to promote the absorption of water from the colon to make your stools more formed. So on the other end of the spectrum, we've got constipation. Constipation is actually more common in tube-fed patients than diarrhea. If your patient is constipated, the first thing to consider is whether they're getting enough water. Obviously, enteral formula contains water, but it may not be enough to meet your patient's daily fluid needs. The amount of water your patient needs depends on a few different factors, including their age, their clinical condition, um, if they have renal disease or congestive heart failure. Usually the doctor or dietitian will assess the patient's fluid needs and make a recommendation or an order for free water flushes to get in all the fluid needs throughout the day. And adding extra water to the tube also helps to keep it clear and unclogged. We will talk about unclogging your tube if it does become clogged. So getting enough fiber can also help with constipation. Fiber actually draws water into your colon to make the stool softer. It also helps to add weight to the stool to move it through the colon faster. Insoluble fiber, like we talked about earlier, also adds bulk to the stool. This extra bulk helps to put pressure on the wall of the large intestine, which also helps to speed things up. Formula without fiber is often associated with constipation. So if your patient is on a fiber-free formula, consider one that does contain fiber. And most formulas do contain both soluble and insoluble fiber. If you're giving fiber as a supplement, it's best to increase it gradually and make sure that your patient's getting enough water. So obviously, too much fiber can cause problems as well. So let's Switch gears a little bit and head outside the body to talk about complications that can happen with the skin around the tube. This is what the skin around the tube should look like. That's healthy, clean skin. The skin may look more like this if there's leakage around the tube. Leakage of stomach fluids can happen if the tube fits too loosely. And this may be because the external bolster has moved up the tube or because the balloon doesn't have the right amount of water. So we'll look at that. If, if you are noticing that the skin looks like this or there is leakage happening, we definitely want to apply a type of dressing to absorb that drainage. Um, and you may want to use a skin protectant or a moisture barrier to protect the skin. 
On the flip side, if the tube is too tight against the skin, the pressure can cause damage. You may notice redness, irritation, pain. You can see there I've pointed out the external bolster. Right now it's not too tight, but obviously it was at one point. So checking the external bolster is, is pretty simple. If the tube is, is too loose or too tight, it may need to be adjusted against the skin. The external bolster, as I've pointed out there and on the slide before, is the part of the tube that sits against the skin. There should be about the thickness of a dime between that bolster and the skin. If you have a regular G-tube that doesn't have a balloon, like this one, the external bolster is usually adjustable. So it's always a good idea to note the markings on the tube when it's in the right place. That way, if the tube feels uncomfortable or if there are skin issues that arise, you can tell if the bolster has moved and you can put it back in the right place. If the tube has a balloon, the balloon holds the tube in place with the right amount of water. You should check the amount of water in the balloon on a regular basis for the doctor or if you notice that the tube isn't fitting properly. Um, most recommendations are to check the balloon about once a week. So to check the balloon's volume, the first thing you want to do is determine the amount of water that the balloon should hold. You can find this amount in the manual that comes with the tube or on the balloon port of the tube itself on some brands, like the Mini One. Most balloons hold between 3 to 10 milliliters of water. Once you know how much it should hold, you want to use a 10 milliliter syringe to defl deflate the balloon and notice how much came out. If you've lost quite a bit of water, the balloon might not be holding water properly and you may need to insert a new tube. Otherwise, reinflate with the rec recommended amount of sterile water once you've checked it. You don't want to use air to inflate the balloon. This can actually seep out and deflate it over time. And you don't want to use saline either. Saline can actually clog the access port. You may need to also check that the tube is the right size for your patient. The length of the stoma or the tract that goes from the outside of the skin to the inside of the stomach can be measured. And obviously, there are different sizes of tubes depending on the, the length of that tract. And the sizing can change if your patient gains weight or loses weight or just grows. Hypergranulation tissue may show up as discolored, irritated, angry, raised skin around the tube. You can prevent it by using mild soap and water. You should also make sure that the tube is stabilized properly so that it doesn't move around a lot and irritate the skin. always important to wash your hands before touching the skin. That's definitely one way to prevent um, many issues from happening. A bacterial infection could also occur if moisture remains on the skin around the tube. You may notice pain, inflammation, redness, or drainage um, with an odor or, or a, an off color. You always want to wash your hands and keep the skin around the tube clean and dry. Regular care around the skin of the feeding tube is definitely important. These are all the things that should be done um, regularly. And keep in mind that you should avoid rotating j tubes or J-tubes. Um, you don't want to run the risk of moving of the tip of the tube moving up into the stomach where it shouldn't be. So let's move on to um, dealing with a clogged or a blocked feeding tube. This is quite common um, at home, and I deal with this quite a bit. If you feel a lot of resistance when infusing water or formula, or it just won't go through, the tube may be clogged or blocked. It can become clogged with dried medication or formula. And the number one way to prevent this is to flush the tube regularly with water. So you want to flush that tube before you use it, after you use it, between medications, and always when, when it's not in use as well. You basically want to prevent um, anything drying up in there or air coming in contact with any residual that's left on the inside of the tubing. And remember that water is the best fluid for flushing the tube and keeping it clear. Studies comparing water with other liquids like cranberry juice, soda, definitely show that water is superior. Some of those other types of liquids can actually make the clog worse. 
So medications are the main reason that most tubes become clogged, but you can prevent this by giving meds separately from each other and definitely flushing after each medication. You always want to avoid giving medication directly to the formula. Mixing the two could cause clumps in the formula, which may clog the tube. And remember that not all forms of medication should go down the feeding tube, like enteric coated medications that have a film coating that can clog the tube. Extended release medications that are made to dissolve slowly, those shouldn't go down the tube um, generally either. They shouldn't be crushed. Most capsules can be opened and mixed with water and administered directly into the tube. Liquid forms are usually the best. Just want to make sure that you do um, dissolve them in water first. So if you find or your patient finds that they're unable to get water or formula through the tube, first you want to make sure it's not tanked or clogged or clamped anywhere. Um, I know it sounds silly, but that can sometimes happen. Then you want to try these steps to clear the clog. Now you may need to repeat them a few times, or you may need to soak the water a little bit longer. Um, but you want to start by inserting water into the syringe, into the tube. Um, you can kind of use a push and pull motion on the plunger to help to loosen the clog a little bit. You want to avoid pulling back on the plunger if, if you do have a J tube. You don't want to collapse the tube or, or pull it into the wrong place. Um, and then you want to have that water sit in the tube for a few minutes. I've had patients tell me that they just let it soak in there for an hour, um, and that seems to help sometimes. If you can see the clog, you want to try massaging the tubing with your fingertips. If you can't clear the, the clog after using this method for a few times, there are other things that some doctor's offices or emergency rooms might have available like enzymes or mechanical declogging devices. The final, final thing to do if the tube can't be um, unblocked is to replace it. So that concludes our presentation. I put up some references for you, um, and you'll have access to those. And I want to go ahead and open it up now to quest any questions that you might have. Thank you, Amy. That was really informative. Um, if you have a question for Amy, please type it on the uh, question box to the right-hand side of your screen. Um, there's already um, a lot of questions coming in. So a question, uh, I will not be able to attend the whole webinar. Will this be recorded and um, the slides be available? Uh, yes, um, it is being recorded and will be posted on our community page. Um, and uh, we will be able to provide the PowerPoint slides for you as well. Um, let's see here, a bunch of questions. Um, can I use tap water to clean feeding tubes, or does it need to be sterilized? Um, thank you. That's a good question. Um, I do get that question a lot. Tap water is safe for most patients. Um, the only time you might need to use purified water or sterile water is if the patient is immunocompromised or has some kind of clinical condition. But most of the time, um, regular tap water is fine. Uh, great. Uh, question from Diana. How do you recommend administering Prevacid solutabs as they do not dissolve completely? Yeah, that, that has been an issue that's come up a lot lately. Um, I also work in a hospital, and I've had doctors just switch them to a different medication um, and just avoid using that medication altogether because it, it is known for clogging the tube. Great. Um, in what cases would you recommend homemade blended formulas? Um, another great question. Um, there are a lot of issues to think about when thinking about whether or not you're going to blenderize or make your own formula. Um, there's the time factor. There's making sure that the patient gets the right nutrition so that um, regimen should always be monitored by, by a dietitian to make sure that they're meeting their needs, especially when we're talking about a child. Um, there's also the factor of um, making sure that food safety is followed and that the patient doesn't develop infections as a result. Um, so with all those things in mind, um, Typically, blenderized formulas are, are reserved for people that can't tolerate standard commercial formulas or people that just really want to make their own formula. 
Um, and I think it's great as long as all those factors are considered. Great. Thank you, Amy. Um, if a patient has a J-tube with continuous tube feeding in the J-tube, how often should the J-tube be flushed? Okay, great, great question. Um, J-tubes obviously are, are smaller, smaller lumen than G-tubes, um, and they are at a higher risk of becoming um, becoming clogged, not only because of of their size, but also because of their the tip of where the location of the tip is. Um, so it's important to make sure that you flush them at least every four hours when they're not in use, even if it's only um, half a syringe or a syringe full of water. Um, at least every four hours, it should be flushed. Um, and another question regarding the um, sterile water. I think you already answered that question, so um, thank you for that. Um, Another question here. I'm hearing all this talk about the end fit transition. Can you talk about that? Absolutely. <laughs> There's a lot to talk about with, with end fit. Um, and we've really come a long way because I think we've been kind of waiting for this to come to pass for, for a few years now. Um, several organizations have been working on um, making it so that enteral misconnections just can't happen. Um, there are a lot of factors that predispose this to happen, such as poor lighting, or tired clinicians, or just not paying attention, or things looking the same. But the main reason non-enteral tubes and enteral tubes um, connect, and when they shouldn't, is because they can. Mechanically, they can, they can fit together. Um, so the purpose of NFIT coming down the pike is to prevent that from happening. So what's happened is that manufacturers have come together and come up with um, this standardized approach to um, creating connections that will only connect to other enteral devices. So right now, um, what you're seeing and what you've probably been seeing for a few months is feeding sets have changed. So you'll notice that the Christmas tree or stuck connector is still on the tip. Um, that's a transitional piece, and you can actually take that off of the feeding set. Um, and when I talk about a feeding set, I'm talking about um, the bag that connects to the feeding pump. So you've got your end fit connector, which is there, plus your steps connector, which eventually that step connector piece is going to go away. Um, and we're thinking that that's going to happen, that's slated to happen, in January of 2016 um, when the feeding tubes themselves have adopted this infant connection and when our syringes have adopted the infant connection. So that's supposed to happen in January. Um, there may be a lot of um, confusion or hesitation about making these changes, um, but it's important to work with um, manufacturers and vendors and healthcare professionals all together so that patients get what they need and are able to administer their formula and their medications safely. So expect to see the new um, feeding tubes and syringes starting to, to roll out in January. Great. And there's some more information on our community page um, regarding MFIT. Um, so, uh, you know, if you want something written down that you can document it, um, you can print that out as well. Um, a couple more questions here. Um, how do I know how much water my patient needs? Okay, great question. Um, as I said, lot, lots of things come into play when you're figuring out how much fluid someone needs. Typically, rule, typical rule of thumb for a healthy patient is usually 30 to 40 milliliters per kilogram. If it's an older patient, um, maybe 25 to 30 milliliters per kilogram of body weight. Um, if they're on dialysis or if they have congestive heart failure or edema, usually we go lower than that. Um, if they're in pre-dialysis and they need more fluids, we can go higher. And of course, you're looking at their labs, um, their BUN, um, their sodium, their creatinine to figure out how much fluid is safe for the patient. Um, but typically, you're going to look at how much water they're getting from the formula, and you're going to subtract that from their daily fluid needs, and that's going to be how much extra water that you'll need to use to flush the feeding tubes so that the patient gets enough water. Great. Thank you, Amy. Um, I have a tube-fed patient who complains of gassiness. Should we change the formula? 
That's a great question. Um, lots of lots of things can happen when you're on tube feeding formula, um, or even if you're eating regular foods. Gassiness can be a transitory thing, or it can be a chronic situation. If it if it turns out to be to be chronic, um, if you've been on the same formula for a long time and it's been working fine up until now, um, there's always methicone or, or anti-gas medications that patients can try. Um, or if they're just un still uncomfortable and they want to try a different formula, sometimes it might help to try a formula with a little bit less fiber in it. Too much fiber can cause, can cause gassiness. Um, and we didn't really touch on um, venting the tube or, or gassiness during the presentation, but that's also something that some people do or need to do, especially um, certain populations. So sometimes that is a factor. Um, patients can vent their tubes, just open up the tube, um, kind of push on their stomach and, and let the air um, release that way. And obviously there's other um, solutions like barrel valves um, for some patient populations. Great. Thank you, Amy. That concludes um, our webinar. I think that's all the time we have for questions. Um, please join us October 14th for our awesome roundtable. We have four uh, um, awesome who can take your questions. Uh, so that will be October 14th. Feel free to sign up and register for that webinar on our community page. Um, I'd like to thank Amy for that great presentation. Um, if you have any other questions for Amy, you can contact her at rd at shieldhealthcare.com. And um, thank you for participating in the webinar, and we will see you October 14th. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.